Hi, my name is John Downing, and I am a limnologist and, a, and aquatic ecologist, and I um, created this course in aquatic uh, uh, ecology and limnology, and this is uh, session nine, and we're uh, going to be talking about lake and pond origin. Where do these things come from? Um, it's important because where they come from me, uh, gives us a, a large hint about how they work and what their characteristics are. So my objectives for this session are simple. Learn the general process of lake and pond formation. Learn how many lakes there are in the world. Learn where they are and learn the diverse processes of lake, pond, and wetland formation. And it's all pretty straightforward. Uh, well, anyway, I just will uh, review that the, uh, it's um, basin formation really influences morphometry and Morphometry influences important things like stratification and zonal composition, extremely important characteristics uh, uh, of um, char characteristics to uh, know about in order to understand the ecology of these systems. And also base basin formation indicates the underlying geology, and geology also influences chemical composition and trophic status. So, um, you know, how are lakes formed? Well, lakes are formed by vir virtually any surface or subsurface process that results in depressions on the Earth's surface that can accumulate water. I mean, that's basically it. So use your imagination and think of what kinds of things can make a, a, a some kind of depression on Earth. Um, there are just tons of ways the lakes can be formed, and I'll go through them uh, rather quickly so that you can hopefully understand uh, some of them and be able to use them in thinking about aquatic ecosystems. So wetlands are also formed in the same kinds of ways. They're formed by the same processes as lakes, but they tend to be shallower. And um, they're also um, formed by the successional filling of lakes and sometimes along the beds of streams and rivers, as we saw in, in previous um, in, in previous uh, sessions. So here are the world's largest lakes all gathered together. It may surprise you that things like Caspian Sea, Black Sea, Aral Sea, and so on, uh, shown here way bigger than it is now, um, are actually lakes. They are. Um, they're enclosed. Um, they are saline. There's quite a lot of saline water in the world, and uh, much of that saline water can be found in some of these very, very large lakes. You see on, on, on here uh, uh, Lake Superior, uh, uh, supposed to be pretty much the largest area freshwater lake in the world. Um, uh, one that has even more volume would be um, Lake Baikal, which uh, looks uh, you know, relatively small, not really shockingly large, um, but uh, contains a phenomenal quantity of water because it's very, very deep. So these are the world's largest lakes. So where in the world are the lakes? Um, the, um, the blue line it shows the latitudinal distribution of lakes in the world. And due to glaciation of, and a variety of other processes, much of the lake's uh, surface area um, exists between about 40 and 80 degrees north latitude. Not so much uh, in the way of lakes at equivalent latitude in the southern hemisphere simply because of the distribution of land mass. But there are a lot of lakes around the equator also. And, and you can think back to what we talked about concerning streams. Um, you will obviously are going to have lakes in any place. You have a lot of stream flow and um, um, and you have uh, land landforms with lots of depressions in it. So um, clearly around the equator where you have an excess of rainfall over evapotranspiration and in the northern and southern hemispheres in the sort of the temperate zone would be good candidates for at least having a lot of water. Um, the impoundments, uh, the, those would be things like reservoirs, not so many of them, not so much area covered by those, but they also tend to be in sort of the agricultural areas of the world. And then if we look at rivers, river area um, is more evenly distributed, but a lot of rivers around the equator where uh, the land is old, uh, relatively unglaciated, of course, and um, has a lot of uh, excess precipitation. New data are showing us now that small lakes cover more area than large ones in the world. And, and this I don't expect you to uh, remember too much, but this is how we character, characterize area distributions of lakes in the world. This is the number of lakes of greater area than this. 
and you can see these form a fairly regular this is worldwide sort of canonical large uh, a, a large lake distribution. If you extrapolate that line upward and upward, you can see that there are really are a lot of lakes that um, are very, very small in the world. Uh, so how much uh, area do lakes cover exactly? Well, um, current data suggests that there are probably more lakes than this, but they probably cover about uh, uh, 4.2 million uh, square kilometers and you know, about 300 million lakes worldwide. Um, Minnesota uh, calls itself land of 10,000 lakes, but if you actually do the calculation, it's um, on how many lakes there are bigger than a hectare or so. It's probably land of a million and a half lakes, something like that. There are lots of lakes in the world. Many of them are small. Um, the area of lakes in the world is dominated by those less than a uh, square kilometer. All this, this is not true everywhere, and this is a number that's currently under discussion yeah, by limnologists. Uh, large impoundments cover about a quarter of a million square kilometers, and farm ponds in the world are cover somewhere around uh, 0.1 million um, square kilometers. So something uh, greater than 3% of Earth's land surface is covered by lakes, in, uh, lakes and impoundments and farm ponds. Lakes are formed by 11 major processes, and I thought we might step through those one by one, talk about them, see, look at some pictures of them, um, and uh, discuss how those uh, uh, processes lead to different kinds of lake basins. Um, the 11 are really straightforward. To, again, virtually anything that forms a depression on Earth will form a lake uh, as long as water can accumulate in it. So tectonic basins, volcanic activity, landslides, which you know mis uh, uh, cause differences in shape and systems, usually blocking up rivers and streams, Glaci glaciers, uh, geochemical solution, rivers, uh, that's fluviatile processes, wind can form lakes, shoreline processes along uh, large lakes and um, seas can uh, form lakes, uh, organic accumulation, behavior of higher organisms, here I use higher in, in quotes anyhow, um, and uh, meteoric impact, and we'll just walk through them. Tectonic basins, uh, some of the most um, important um, uh, important uh, tectonic, uh, tectonic basin lakes would be grobbins and fault blocks. Um, a Graben lake, uh, or Graben formation is shown in the upper panel of this. Graben in German means um, uh, means grave, and what it means is they have really steep sides, and you get these kinds of lakes formed where a where a fault uh, a block actually slips down and drops a substantial distance into the earth, uh, leaving a fairly deep basin with steep sides. And uh, fault blocks would be similar to that, although uh, they would be different blocks that would be faulting and dropping away from each other um, that would form depressions in the earth where lakes could could uh, accumulate. Uh, lake Tahoe is a very famous Graben lake, or, or, uh, um, uh, or, or um, well, it's a tectonic basin formed by uh, the dropping away of a block of, um, uh, of the Earth's surface down uh, with faults along either side. And um, Lake Tahoe uh, is something like 1,600 feet deep. So it's a, a very deep um, a deep system formed in, by tectonic basins. Now you can, um, you, here's a, uh, uh, here you can see Lake Tahoe, um, a lovely photograph, and you see also the um, incredible clarity of Lake Tahoe. In spite of its isolation, however, it still is um, undergoing some degree of very gradual eutrophication, but has very clear uh, clear waters in range of, I think, about 20 meters, um, but it has very steep sides. If you look on YouTube, you can find all kinds of videos of people in uh, various submarine vehicles um, studying uh, Lake Tahoe, fascinating lake with a limnological institute on the shore. Also, a, a lot... Uh, <laughs> also, uh, a lot of mystery involved with it, but um, uh, look look into that if you're interested. Um, another sort of tectonic um, uh, tectonic uh, device that um, leads to um, uh, leads to lake formation uh, would be epigenic uplift, and 
um, here you can see on the left-hand panel of this sort of the Baltic and how it was formed as a as a inland lake um, by a, a large ice block that um, uh, that pushed down on the rock surface. Now, um, actually, rock is compressible if you put a substantial en enough amount of weight on it, and if you push it down with uh, oh uh, a kilometer and a half of of ice or something, it will tend to compress. And then once the ice has gone away, um, the um, the lake and land surface underneath it will rebound, forming a relatively high uh, water body uh, that's fed by a variety of different tributaries. And that's how the Baltic was uh, formed, was uh, by the sort of uh, marine surface that was, um, it became marine and was compressed downward and then bounced back up uh, very, very slowly, uh, leading to um, the formation of the Baltic. Um, other tectonic basins would be rift lakes, and these are very famous lakes in uh, on, in the east part of Africa, Lake Victoria, Lake Albert, uh, Edward, Kivu, uh, uh, Tanganyika, Malawi, um, often, uh, well, very, very important and interesting lakes in the region. These were formed by fault lines and slipping, again, of um, um, uh, slipping of the Earth's surface downward, and um, they can uh, these sort of warping and up tilting around these sorts of basins can um, uh, can occur. That also causes uh, formation of lakes, and um, uh, and it can be through various processes. Uh, the formation of of say paraclines, or uh, uh, here here we have a monocline, and here we have a uh, overfold, and you can see that these all form areas in which lakes could uh, accumulate. Uh, a tectonically formed lake uh, in the region that uh, in the Midwest of the U.S. is uh, Real Foot Lake, and uh, Real Foot Lake was formed in 1811 by a pretty substantial earthquake. Um, and uh, basically, if you look at this old map over here on the on the left hand side, um, this um, there was a a dome, a sort of a a low dome that formed here due to an earthquake lifted up this land surface here and then water flowed down into this depression on this side which formed this new lake which was Real Foot Lake and the um, uplift was so substantial that it lifted up enough on the Mississippi River that the river flowed backward for some period of time and um, this is written up in all the newspapers of the day uh, quite a, a, f a fantastic occurrence but it also gave rise to this, uh, fan this great big lake. It says, in 1811 to 1812, the greatest, earth, uh, the greatest earthquakes in North American history enlarged existing bodies of water, blocked inflowing streams, and extended the boundaries of a cypress swamp to form Real Foot Lake. And it's a very important, um, uh, important uh, recreational resource in that region now. Um, so that's another sort of tectonic lake. So tectonic basins can be formed virtually by any kind of motion in the Earth's crust. There are relic, relic lakes that are uplifted uh, sea bottom depressions, uh, such as the Caspian Sea. Newland lakes, um, Florida basically lifted up out of the sea, and uh, Lake Okeechobee and uh, Lake Okeechobee and several other lakes in in, uh, uh, in the Florida Peninsula were formed in that way. Uh, tectonic drainage reversal, um, as in uh, as in Real Foot Lake, upwarping around basins, uh, as you see uh, uh, in uh, Lake Victoria and those uh, Rift Valley lakes in the eastern part of Africa. Uh, local subsidence that was also Real Foot uh, Valley valleys dammed by syn synclines. Grobbins between faults, tilted fault blocks, and so on and so forth. Lots of ways that movements in the earth crust, Earth's crust can form um, uh, form depressions that um, uh, that will accumulate water and become lakes. Now, the next category I'd like to talk about are vo volcanic lakes, and there are a couple of different kinds. Caldera are the more obvious ones, and some of you could probably think of. Uh, caldera lakes, and I'll show you a picture of one in a second, but also volcanic dams. Sometimes um, volcanic eruptions will will um, block entire valleys and cause lake formation sort of at the base of the uh, base of the cone. But another really important uh, 
kind of um, uh, lake uh, formed by volcanoes would be caldera. There are a lot of these in, in Africa. There is Crater Lake in, out on near the west coast of the United States. Uh, very deep lakes, extremely tiny watersheds. They tend to be very clean uh, and clear and uh, beautiful recreational lakes are uh, receiving really only input from uh, precipitation. There are also are volcanic mar lakes, and a uh, mar is sort of an explosion uh, from a um, <coughs> from a um, blocked up um, uh, lava lava flow. So um, these they create uh, explosions. Here you can see a crater. This is a caldera at the top, and all kinds of mar lakes forming around that because some of these um, the uh, um, the lava flows. Uh, in these lava ducts uh, would become blocked and then would blow out the side of the col um, of the uh, uh, volcanic cone. Uh, so uh, a lot of those in, in volcanic areas. So volcanic lakes are formed in a variety of sorts of ways. Uh, craters and cinder cones, which we've seen. Mars, these are these explosive eruptions. Crater lakes and stratovolcanoes. Conche. Uh, Conche is a faulting over a lava chamber and uh, this of course means a shell so f a shell um, 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 a shell of, of cool lava on the outside um, lava would disappear out of it and then they would collapse in making um, a, a lava a, a chamber uh, for lakes can form um, oh uh, collapse lava flows and dammed valleys and so on lots of different ways to, that volcanoes volcanoes can cause the accumulation of water on the surface of the earth. Um, there also are lakes formed by landslides and these can in include rock slides, mud flows, peat slides, all kinds of things. Um, I'll show you one, Hebgen Lake, in just a minute. That It's a fairly well-known lake in um, the um, uh, Yellowstone Park of the United States. Um, there can also be lakes on irregular surfaces of landslides. That is, here you see a landslide. Lakes can form in this area. Uh, lakes can also be formed by scree dams due to prolonged rock fall, rocks falling into valleys, causing water to back up. Um, th this particular one was fairly spectacular. Here you see a photograph and a, well, an old photograph, and this is a newer photograph of, of Earthquake Lake in Montana. Um, this was a great tragedy. It was an overnight, um, uh, uh, well, there was an earthquake that caused a big landslide. Landslide came down and covered a series of campsites, killing a number of people. It was a, a major tragedy in the United States in, I think, the 1960s, although we'll figure that out in a, in a second here. Um, uh, because of this great uh, fall of material into a, a very active river, then, of course, the river would back up and create a lake. There's some photographs of uh, shortly after uh, after this uh, Hebgen Lake disaster. Here you see pieces of an old highway, landslide, buildings, and so on, and some um, uh, ancient-looking uh, scuba divers who were uh, trying to look for survivors, I guess, and uh, bodies and so on in this lake. Um, they're walking along a, a highway, actually, that had been flooded over by creation of this um, by this landslide lake in Yellowstone. Now, glaci glacial lakes are, um, uh, glaci glaciers form lakes a lot, and a lot of the, as I mentioned in the early graph where I showed the sort of the distribution of the latitude, distribution of lakes, um, lake area and latitude, I said something like um, in the glaciated north uh, temperate zone, uh, there are lots of lakes, and in fact that's true. There are different kinds of glacial glacial lakes. Um, the main kind probably is is uh, uh, that we need to pay attention to. While well, that you see most of would be uh, basins formed in glacial drift, and there um, a terrific number of them that have been formed on these irregular surfaces left behind by glaciers. But there are also lakes that are held by ice by um, living glaciers. There are glacial rock basins. Uh, that have been formed and also a uh, morainic and outwash dams could function really a lot like these uh, landslide lakes in the same sort of way and I'll show you a photo I mean an image of some of those 
So um, probably here are some terms you should know if you're going to be working at all with glacial lakes. But um, the kinds of important uh, terms are things like drift, till, moraines. Um, the rest of the terms are maybe less important. But drift is material laid down directly by ice or deposited by glacial activity. Whereas till is just sort of a mishmash of, um, of drift, uh, uh, drift material. Um, and um, a, dr a drift is sometimes quite stratified, as you can probably see over here. Uh, this is drift here, and you see different strata. And again, sp the strata, uh, um, the stratification of the drift is caused, of course, by um, the velocity of the water leaving it, being able to move certain kinds of materials and not others. Moraines are formed by deposits of unstratified uh, drift. And um, one will find a, this is an end moraine. You can see a great big bunch of, um, um, a bunch of, of till uh, deposited here. You can see how this would form a, a sort of a proglacial lake. Um, also, the uh, retraction of the glacier leaves a bunch of, um, the, uh, a bunch of different kinds of irregularities on the surface of the land. So um, you, there are other things like drumlins and eskers and um, outwash plains and things like that. Here's an esker. That's a, a long, skinny kind of deposit formed by water flow off the glaciers. Um, <coughs> but there are three kinds of glaciers that um, we should consider. Um, and the ice sheets down here are probably the ones that are ice sheets and continental uh, glaciers are those um, that probably form the, have formed the most lakes on, uh, in the world today. But there are also are valley glaciers. And these are streams of ice that flow down the valleys of mountainous areas. And they can be you know, hundreds to hundreds of thousands of meters in length. And many of them now are, are melting uh, in any places that they had been deposited. There also are Piedmont glaciers. Piedmont means foot of mountain. So this is where two or more valley glaciers might uh, emerge and coalesce to form this apron of moving ice on a plain below. Um, now, ice sheets and continental glaciers are really similar. And ice sheets tend to be broad, mound-like masses of glacier ice that spread radially by being pushed out under their own weight. Um, continental glaciers are ice sheets of massive proportions. And um, the, 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 the withdrawal of the last uh, continental uh, glaciers in North America occurred about 10 to 12,000 years ago. And a lot of the lake area that we see in North America comes from that um, type of formation. So let's look at some of these sorts of glacial lakes. Here's a, these lakes are held by ice. Here's an a, um, ice-held lake. Uh, this you can see how this could occur that if a big bl uh, glacier descends into a valley it can simply dam up that valley and cause uh, the formation of a lake these um, the lakes will wax and wane spectacularly um, and uh, are are worthy of watching and this is here's um, a lake that disappeared basically in 1929 by breaching of ice that had been held back by a, a, a glacial dam other kinds of glacial lakes, uh, these are uh, glacial uh, rock basins. And um, I've shown you this in previous um, sessions. But here you can see the sort of montane glaciers, these U-shaped valleys. And oftentimes, uh, we'll get the formation of um, lakes up in the uh, end uh, ends of these. This would be a cirque lake um, or a circus, like a circus lake, a circle lake um, with a, a, a that uh, is formed by sort of up at the upper end of this montane glacier. And so you'll see those um, uh, as sort of remnants of, of glaciation in some areas. Another kind of glacial lake is a, a lake formed by moranic and outwash dams. And this is Green Lake in Wisconsin in the Midwest US. Um, uh, this has, was a, a lake that was formed in a broad valley then that was dammed by glacial deposits down here. And um, uh, uh, this is an important, uh, uh, important recreational lake. But the lake is found in a tilted valley that's dammed here at the west end. Um, now, uh, glacial rock basins, uh, there are also lakes that are ex excavated uh, by um, 
exca excavated by glacial uh, movement, in fact, continental ice sheets. And um, th there are two, uh, the glacier, the, um, sorry, the Great Lakes of the United States are, are one of those kind, uh, are one example of that kind of lake. And here you can see 14,000 years ago, the ice pushing in this direction, excavating. Here we have approximately Chicago area and maybe early Lake Erie. Withdrawal of that ice or melting away of that ice uh, 9,000 years ago or so. And here you see a progression taken from Hutchinson's um, um, uh, great monographs on limnology showing um, how the, how the uh, uh, Great Lakes are, the geologists uh, currently think the Great Lakes were formed well, simply by some excavation and digging out of the Great Lakes. I will show you an alternate, um, alternate point of view that I found on YouTube that I think you might find kind of interesting. Um, and there, is, there are people who believe that um, there were natural uh, uh, depressions and weak places that were probably excavated. And those weak places may have also um, uh, resulted from tectonic activity. And let's have a look at this. There's a long disclaimer at the beginning of it because no one seems to be able to find the original source. And this is reproduced off of YouTube. Um, so uh, yes, it's made by Neil Adams. Uh, and as a result these islands broke off and strung out like beads on a string as a result of this pulling apart there is a massively weakened and stretched out u-shaped area of land which we mark down the left by these lakes which are stretch marks. On the right side is the St. Lawrence Seaway. Examine how clear it is that this area has been pulled up and out of this right side. And the explosive focus of this eruptive pulling is the Great Lakes. You may have been taught in school that the Great Lakes and other lakes... This is the editorial part. This is simply not true. When we go backward in time, the St. Lawrence Seaway will reclose as we expect. More significantly, as all this happens, the Great Lake will close. And as we go forward in time, the eruptive spreading of the land moving apart tears open and creates the Great Lake at this key focal point. This is the origin of the Great Lake. Yes, well, in fact, there's geological evidence that disagrees with this. It's it's superb, um, superb artwork and quite compelling and interesting. And and likening the Great Lakes to stretch marks is also quite interesting. It could have been, of course, a mixture of tectonic and glacial forces. Um, there's really no doubt that there was some excavation of the Great Lakes as well. Um, now, probably one of the more important uh, ways that lakes are formed in uh, formed by continental glaciers and ice sheets is the formation of kettle lakes. And if you're familiar at all with the lakes of, well, several in New England uh, and um, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota, and other places in the world, many of these lakes were formed simply by melting out of ice blocks out of um, out of the uh, moranic material and drift. So I think you can imagine quite easily that if you would put an ice cube in tightly packed sand and let it melt away, it would leave a depression. And in fact, many of these kinds of lakes were, um, many, uh, lots and lots of lakes that were formed that way. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of that. Um, let's see, well, let's just go directly here. These are some glacial lakes in, in northern Minnesota. And of course, the shores have been reworked um, by wind and wave action over time. But you can almost picture for some of these where the ice blocks were and how they were situated as they melted out of that, uh, out of that uh, uh, drift material. Um, here we have ground moraine. You can sort of see where these kettle lakes get formed in end moraines. And uh, basically, uh, 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 any place that ice blocks got stranded, they could melt away. Um, look at um, some of these lakes on Google Earth, and um, you'll be able to picture, I think, quite well where those ice blocks were. Here are some other glacial footprints, and this is 
formation of lakes from uh, underflow of water flowing out of an old retreating glacier. Um, and this is again in uh, northern, the northern uh, lake area of northern Minnesota. There's also, this is also a finely, this is uh, northern Wisconsin and also very uh, much ice block pocked area. And again, you can look at these and sort of guess how those chunks of ice were stranded. If you look over to the right, you can see the Antarctic glacial moraine and, um, and pick it out really easily. The, the form of these lakes looks very, very similar to what was left in, um, in say, northern Wisconsin or some of the major lake districts of, of North America. Uh, so um, glacial lakes are formed uh, uh, many kinds of drift basins, and these would be in irregularities in the ground moraine, kettles left by melting ice blocks and outwash, and I've already underscored that those gave rise to literally millions of lakes uh, worldwide, kettles in drift valleys, kettles in pitted outwash plains, kettles in till of continental ice sheets, kettles in eskers, we just saw one of those, and glacial tunnel lakes, we'll probably saw one of those, and uh, thaw or thermal karst lakes and uh, thermal karst lakes we haven't talked about very much uh, here we have in fact at all so here's an image of uh, formation of thermal karst as we um, uh, in areas of permafrost um, as the permafrost melts which is happening actually quite rapidly uh, now there'll be a recession of the land surface area leaving a depression in the surface and you can see on the left hand side so uh, one of these thermal karst lakes Interesting things is the trees bend as they drop, um, as they um, uh, are sort of absorbed by uh, absorbed by the lake, um, and so you can actually date when uh, when these uh, thermal karsts were formed by the bending in the trees. Um, another way that lakes are formed is uh, uh, by solution uh, dissolution of things like. Um, calcium carbonates or limestone rock and um, there, here's a Dolene Lake seen in two, uh, two uh, views on the left hand side and what happens here is that the underlying limestone was, is dissolved by weathering and um, the weathering occurs because of a water combining with carbon dioxide that creates a carbonic acid that uh, dribbles down into the soil, gets uh, attacks the limestone, and uh, uh, and can create um, and create these thermal karst lakes. What you're seeing in the lower photograph is uh, the precipitation of marl, and that's uh, calcium carbonate, basically, basically chalk dust um, that um, turn make creates what's called a whiting event. Uh, and these lakes are often extremely rich in alkalinity or uh, calcium uh, magnesium. Um, carbonates and um, so um, sometimes they will precipitate that material and form a flock in the in the water you see the, see the same thing in this beautifully Caribbean blue lake here, here are a couple of of karst lakes near Winnipeg uh, Sturg Sturgeon Lake on the top and little limestone lake on the bottom uh, and these exist in various areas any place that you really have enough uh, calcium uh, well have enough limestone um, or uh, a limestone parent material that um, alkalinity can be high enough for this to occur. Um, fluviatile processes also form lakes and we talked about this in a previous session when we were talking about formation of, of rivers and succession in rivers. Um, but here you have a diagram of formation basically of, a, of an oxbow lake. It's an old cutoff meander. This river probably once went in this direction around here. This meander then was cut through, leaving this um, depression on the land surface. And I'll show you another bunch of them. This is uh, on the Mississippi River um, at about 47 degrees north um, in, um, in northern Minnesota. And you can see this is a highly meandered system. And here are lots of ancient um, uh, oxbow lakes and meander scars and wetlands that are created by the meandering of that river. So fluviatile processes are important formers of lakes too. And um, here's another uh, river process that forms lakes. Um, this is, um, uh, sometimes uh, rivers will bring in enough sediment into other rivers that they can form a, a riverine or fluvial dam. 
and damming up the water. This is Lake Pepin in Minnesota on the border between Wisconsin and Minnesota. And um, so the Mississippi River basically flew, flows through this river. The Chippewa River brings in sediment, builds up a great big dam here, and then back up Lake Pepin, a, a fairly substantial um, recreational system within the Mississippi River system. Um, so river formed lakes, there are a bunch of them. They're plunge pool lakes. So if you have ancient water or extinct waterfalls, they can dig big um, uh, depressions in the ground. Uh, fluvial dam lakes like Lake Pepin that I just showed you. Uh, river or stream deltas dividing lakes in two, which occurs, I've seen this in a, a variety of uh, places. Lateral lakes, and these can be natural levee lakes. Um, if you followed the, uh, the session that we did on stream formation, you can imagine how uh, 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 levees are formed and often lakes will be formed along the uh, para sort of parallel to the main channel of a river. Uh, deltaic levees, anywhere you have a delta formed, such as where a river will flow into the sea, or a large river will, f or a large stream will flow into a lake. There often will be small ponds and lakes that are formed on that. And also mares, these are formed behind river, river levees. And I think I, I have a photo. Here's a, a a map. This is a beer drinking map, actually, of the of mares, which are. Um, uh, called the Norfolk Broads in sort of the area of Norf Norfolk in England, and they you note that they show really the location of pubs, but um, but also you can see these lovely uh, uh, mares that are formed sort of along along uh, along the rivers. So rivers can form um, uh, form uh, lakes in a bunch of different ways. Now lakes can also be formed by wind and um, basins can be dammed by windblown sand and also uh, in any place you have well oriented sand dunes you may have depressions between them and that's what you can see on the in the bottom uh, image these are the sand hills in Nebraska a bunch of little lake systems that are formed between uh, well oriented or closely oriented sand dunes also in other areas you can find deflation basins um, or lunettes uh, that uh, form famously in uh, from drifting sand um, and sometimes if there's enough precipitation you can um, form lakes uh, in those sorts of ways in areas with a lot of windblown material. Lakes can also be formed by marine and lacustrine shore processes. Um, lacustrine means um, related to lakes um, and here we see some um, uh, this is a, a, an old map from Hutchinson's monograph, but you can see along, this is the ocean out here, and um, wherever you have sand being moved uh, by uh, marine waves and so on, you can form, you can cut off, essentially cut off bays um, uh, or river bays uh, by uh, uh, river mouth sand dunes and actually create lakes that are isolated from the sea and relatively fresh in water. And here's, this is Etang de Cazo, and this is in France. Here's the same system over here. I think this is the same um, uh, same image. I think this comes from Google Earth. Um, uh, but you can form these along, uh, these are important um, brackish water or often freshwater systems that are formed along the shores of uh, the sea. Likewise, you can form lakes uh, here's a little lake. This is in, in, within Leech Lake, um, again in northern Minnesota. And this um, uh, lake was formed actually by the stranding of an old part of the lake due to um, wave-driven sand deposits that formed these uh, particular big beach areas that eventually filled in enough sediment between these two points, of the, between these this um, big island and this point, that it, it actually uh, created a connection between um, the lake and the, uh, the between the island and the point, but also cut off um, cut off a lake. Here's a another little one. This is probably a river mouth lake over here. Uh, here's one that's formed in a, a bunch of um, sediment. This would be more of a wetland wetland area, but this was definitely formed by shoreline processes. Um, oh. This is a, a little lake in the state of Iowa, and uh, Iowa is a very um, agricultural area and not always terribly friendly to the existence of wetland areas. This is um, what uh, 
Crystal Lake um, looked like in 1916. And you can see that this entire, this was a, a lake essentially formed by cutting off this river mouth here by this uh, um, river mouth uh, bar that uh, became a dam and closed off all but a small tributary um, in this lake. Now this is a very old map. This is how it looks today uh, with almost no water inflow and no lake there. This is superimposition of the old um, old land uh, use, uh, the old map on um, modern land use. You can see that a lot of this is now being farmed but um, was a cutoff lake uh, by shore processes. Winds from the south east uh, came in here and transported enough material across the uh, a bar of uh, the mouth of that uh, stream inflow to cause it to be cut off and isolated as a lake. Now, lakes can also be formed by organic accumulation, and um, sometimes uh, dams, uh, lakes can uh, can be dammed up in rivers by dense growth of plants. And these are called phytogenic lakes. And I've seen some of these. They can also uh, be uh, formed within coral atolls. Here's a, a diagram of one a coral atoll, uh, a, a sort of a ring-shaped uh, island with a lake in the inside. The lake kept relatively fresh by um, relatively fresh by rainfall. Here's another coral atoll here with a lake on the inside. Again, probably relatively fresh compared to the sea. Human beings also form lakes, and uh, I've called those uh, before, I've called those um, impoundments, but uh, people build reservoirs. We also have mines, um, gravel mines that create lakes, and other kinds of um, higher organisms such as beaver form a large uh, number of lakes that are important. Uh, this shows the relationship between time and cumulative cumulative impounded area in the United States and I think you can see that from the 1700s to more modern times the rate was a fairly rapid uh, growth of impoundments. Uh, lots of uh, farm ponds are built in the world and those uh, also um, cover a substantial area of the planet now especially given the demands of uh, uh, increased demands for food as population increases. Uh, lakes can also be formed by meteoric impact. This is called the Reservoir Manicougan. This is in the province of Quebec in Canada, and um, it was not really much of a reservoir, really. It's been there for a very long time, and obviously it was formed by meteoric impact. If you have uh, um, an old globe or anything, you can look at it, and you can pick this out pretty pretty easily. It's a very, uh, it's a large system, and um, obvious in its regular form. Uh, has a, a dam down here that really um, is uh, doesn't really hold back much of the water compared to what was there before. This is um, this is a, a lake 50 miles across, uh, and this is just northeast of Quebec City in the province of Quebec in Canada. Um, meteoric impact can change uh, landscapes. Here's another meteor impact. This is in uh, northern Minnesota. Here's the Mississippi River. I think you, this is we saw this before. We were looking at. Um, uh, the uh, Oxbow Lakes, um, this basically rerouted the Mississippi when it hit. Um, so it does change water flow and form uh, water, um, uh, water bodies as they exist on the planet. Now let's look at the origin of lakes in, in the world. And I, uh, this is a table out of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the limnology text by Jakob Kalf. Um, and uh, here uh, you can see the number of lakes in the world. These are actually have been revised upward, but in fact, um, the relative um, numbers are just about the same now. Uh, Kalf shows something like four million uh, lakes. There are cl clearly more than that uh, of glacial origin, um, and but uh, shows this as a large percentage of the lakes on the planet, and I think that's accurate. Um, uh, you can see the number of other kinds of lakes are less and also the total lake area covered by them. Now one thing I'd like you to look at on here is the sort of the relative sizes of these lakes. Um, in fact, if you divide the total area 
by the number of lakes, you'll get something like the average size of these systems. And I, I'd like you to think about this, but uh, cl uh, clearly, and I'm sorry these numbers don't line up perfectly, but glacial lakes, at least those that were inventoried here, have about um, an average size of a third of a square kilometer, whereas tectonic lakes are much bigger. They tend to be um, uh, something like um, nine times that size or ten times, tenfold larger on average if you divide this out. Coastal lakes tend to be bigger than the glacial lakes too. And riverine lakes are somewhere around the same size as the glacial lakes. Volcanic formed lakes are also rather large and possibly because of the sort of cataclysmic uh, events that give rise to these lakes. And um, the rest of the lakes are usually kind of small. But we know this is too small of a number. It's much larger than that now. Um, uh, but because we've inventoried the smaller lakes of the world much better than we had before. Finally, let's have a, a quick look at where the lakes are uh, located in the world. And this is a map that was uh, generated by a paper that has uh, been published in Limnology and Oceanography, um, and uh, I think in 2009. And um, basically this DL is the density or the... Um, the number of lakes per unit area of lakes between one square kilometer and ten square kilometers as an index of where the lakes are. Um, I think you can see pretty clearly where uh, that this map reproduces most of the lake uh, important lake areas of the world. Um, and uh, uh, but this uh, map it will be changing as runoff changes due to climate change. Some areas will be losing a lot of. Um, um, losing a lot of lake area and um, some very few will be gaining lake area. So to summarize from this session, lakes are formed by really any process that makes a uh, makes a depression in the ground um, and there's something like 402 million lakes in the world although uh, CALF's table only shows a fraction of those but they cover somewhere in the neighborhood of 3 percent of the land surface of the planet. Lakes are concentrated near the equator and in the temperate latitudes, and more of them are in the north temperate zone due to there just being more land area in the north temperate zone than you would find in the south temperate zone. Uh, lakes, ponds, and wetlands are really formed by a variety of different processes, and we, here we cataloged and reviewed 11 major processes, and it's really dominated by glacial and tectonic formation, with tectonic formation uh, creating much larger systems than glaciers on average.